So hi, everybody. I'm Carolyn. I'm one of NewsHour Extra's summer interns, and I'm excited to be attending this Zoom Q&A on school reopenings with Juliet Kayam. Uh, we became interested in talking more about this topic after hosting a meeting in our, in our summer teacher Zoom series on school reopenings. Um, a lot of teachers showed up with a lot of questions and worries. Um, they had a lot of support and creative ideas for one another along the lines of online or hybrid learning, um, but a lot of questions and worries about the health of themselves and their families. Um, and I'm also really excited about this conversation because I myself am a college student in Massachusetts and I'm making decisions about whether to come to school in person this fall. Um, so we decided to put a call out to include parents and students as well as teachers. We received dozens of questions, um, but we picked just several to ask today. Um, so all this is why I'm excited to introduce our guest expert for this Q&A, Juliet Kayyem. If you don't already know, Juliet is the former Assistant Secretary for Homeland Security under Obama. She is a professor at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government and author of Security Mom. And you are currently serving on a consulting team advising the state of Massachusetts on its school reentry plans. Um, many people watching this video might know you from your article as well. You made a Atlantic article recently, you wrote it called Reopening Schools was just an afterthought. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. And thanks to teachers and the students uh, for, for listening. So maybe to start us off, um, do you think you could talk to us a little bit about what should our goals be and our yeah. mindset as we approach the challenge of reopening schools? I mean, you know, look, look, the primary goals, of course, the safety and security and health security of our kids and our families and teachers and staff. And uh, but it's you know, it's 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 really hard to know when that moment is because we have to get back to school probably well before a vaccine, right? Everyone thinks, oh, a vaccine is going to solve the problem. There's going to be a long period of time between when a vaccine is found and when it's manufactured and distributed. And so we have to figure out ways in which we open up. So we're learning from other countries. The challenge for the United States is, of course, we're doing this while the pandemic is still going on. So if I were queen, and this is maybe where I do have changed my mind a little bit since the article, where maybe there's some places that can open up, and I do think that's true. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of places that should not open up now, the South, the Southwest, uh, because of a raging pandemic, because they just don't have it under control. Um, and so, but, you know, part of it is as a Homeland Security planner, and that was what the article was about, was here's a critical infrastructure, schools. We didn't conceive, like, like water and electricity and food supply, we didn't conceive of it as a critical infrastructure, but it turns out you can't function as a society uh, if, you're, if kids aren't in school. And so, and so we focus on all these other things instead of how the heck do we open them? And so, but in, the good news is, is that we're learning as we go along. So never think of things as binary, like yes, no, it's a, it's a, it's a pandemic. I mean, there's like, everything's gray at this stage. But how I think about it is, and this will guide, I think every answer is um, to, to try to balance three important goals here okay so the first when you think about reopening schools so the first is that, that's based on the science so i'm not a doctor as you know i i'm a i'm a consumer of health intelligence i see what's happening with the virus and so i've changed i i used to think masks weren't necessary now i'm a mask freak and ask my kids you know so the first is you want to um minimize contact intensity um so that just basically means we know how the virus spreads we know um, that it spreads in some conditions much faster than others. So let's be smart about it. So contact intensity, you know, it's, it's why, why are bars open? It's, you know, why are we, you know, why, you know, what, like that seems, you know, why are gyms open? They exist for contact intensity. So it may mean, so basically our answer to that is what we call, you know, de-densifying, which is essentially just, you just want to make sure that people aren't on top of each other doing this. That's a de -dens and so lots of teachers will have heard that we're going to de-densify the classroom. Um, and it also means that we're not treating every piece of the educational experience the same. There will be curriculum, which you can maybe do depending on the facility. Um, sports, harder, harder to, you know, foot, high school football, you tell me, that's, it exists for contact intensity. The second is you want to manage 
the number of people that you're around. So th that, that is, again, de-densification, but it's just basically why teachers and, and parents are hearing about skewed uh, schedules. It's just a numbers game at this stage. That's all we know about the virus. It just, it's not a smart virus. It's got one simple goal, which is I just want the next live uh, host. And so if you're around, it's just number five is less than 50 is less than 500. So that's just the way to think about it. So that's why you're hearing about, you know, these various um, scheduling changes. And it also may be why, um, um, you know, it, it might be smart to bring K through th three back first let it go a month, see what happens, and then make a new decision for four through eight, because we know K through three is really key uh, in terms of the educational experience. Okay, then finally, um, you, you maximize um, personal mitigation for teachers, for parents, and for kids, obviously. And that, that means masking, of course. It means uh, hybrid schedules, if, if, if you can make that work, obviously, or hybrid teaching, if you can make that work, both digital um, and, and in person. Um, it means, you know, uh, 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 how we design the buildings, how we design the classrooms, just, you know, how, how the kids are going to eat, um, you know, and so, so you, you minimize contact intensity, manage the number of people you're around, and maximize personal responsibility or personal mitigation. It's, it's not easy. Um, you have to be ready to pull the plug if you did it wrong. Uh, but there is a strategy behind it. And I want parents and teachers and kids to know that, that, yeah, yes, there may be carelessness in some instances, but for the most part, that's what's guiding the decisions of yes, no, maybe in between. One question is coming from a longtime Twitter follower and fan of yours, uh, Tally Clyde, who is a teacher and parent in North Attleboro, Massachusetts. Oh, good. Um, wanted to say hi. And hi, Tally. <laughs> and they wanted to ask, what is your advice to school leaders for communicating with their stakeholders yeah. and communities? Um, and when and how should they release clear plans despite there being knowns and considerable unknowns? It's the perfect question. So there is a responsibility on the school district. You've got the school district, you've got the principal, and then you've got the teacher, right? And then you have various other coaches and stuff like that. So I do a lot of advising. I advise lots of people right now. So, and, and the, the, the guidance is always the same. The first is get a battle rhythm. This is not once every, once when I feel like it. Parents and teachers um, uh, and students uh, want to know that you're thinking about this. So if you want to, you know, it, it might be daily. It might be every, every other day, whatever it is. Get a battle rhythm of communication because, because the facts are changing so fast. The second thing is um, embrace the numbers. Uh, so school districts and principals have got to have very good situational awareness, whether it's, you know, using data from the city or the state, um, and because people want facts. And the good news is, is in a world of seemingly fake news and all the things, the American public is getting this, people. And I, I, this is what, this is what makes me happy. And um, the American public, 80% in the most recent polling, listens to the doctors, listens to the authorities, does not listen to the, all the crazy debates amongst the politicians. So they just want facts. Uh, third, embrace um, empathy. Uh, nothing is worse than to feel like you're not getting it, right? Or the person, you know, teachers are feeling a certain thing. Uh, teachers that have preconditions are feeling a different thing. Parents, working mothers will, you know, may do, <laughs> are willing to do anything to get their kids out of the house where other parents may not, you know, I mean, everyone's different, but you have to be receptive to those differences. It's not about you. Don't feel defensive. It's, it's just a, the way to communicate. And then finally, embrace change and hope. The hope is we're going to figure this out and your kids are not a guinea pig. Uh, and the figuring out may be I need eight week, more weeks or 12 more weeks. The calendar is ours. This idea that we have to make a decision by September, why? Like, you know, maybe push it to October. Uh, colleges and universities are doing that. They're, they're playing funky with the calendar. I think K through 12 can as well. Um, and then, you know, embrace the sort of change. Um, what I know now is different. Um, I could bring everyone in and there's a massive outbreak and all of a sudden I'm closed down. You need to prepare people for that. They, they need to know that um, the virus, the virus can, the virus is stupid, honestly. It's just, as I said, it's just stupid. 
we have to play smart, but the virus does demand respect. Um, and that respect is gonna come in different forms. So that's how I, I think about it right now in terms of communication, the battle rhythm, empathy, numbers, hope, future change. That is, that's the message. I don't know may sometimes be the message. Mm -hmm. Jennifer Collins in Raleigh, North Carolina is a parent yeah. and she wants to know what is a good metric to use for my state or city to decide if school is a safe environment for my daughter and her peers. Um, do you think there are clear signs or numerical thresholds that make returning to school safe or not safe for a community? So, yes. I mean, so once again, I'm not a doctor, so I'm very careful. And that number might change, but I think anything, you know, if you, if you have more than 5% of a population, of a potentially infected population, so we try to get under 1%. If you've got more than 5%, it's going to be hard to convince me that that's going to be safe for a, for a community. So that's my number. Um, and in fact, I would, if I opened, I would advise a school to close if they start to see community spread, because schools don't live in isolation. But I don't think it's realistic to think that a single case should shut everything down. I think also what we have to remember is we are gonna have to manage with this virus for a long, like until further notice. I don't know what to tell people. Like there's no end date at this stage. We don't have a vaccine yet. But we can do it. We can manage around it through the techniques that I described through, through healthy buildings, you know, circulation outside, de-densification, masking, all the tools that we have available to us um, that will make it safer for all of us uh, in the future. So that's how I think about metrics in terms of I've got an, a number in my head where I would be very uncomfortable bringing, bringing students together if the community is impacted, but also a realism that, you know, there will be cases. we got to figure out you know, a school district has to figure out what, how, what are they going to do to contain that? That's why you're hearing about pods um, and, and, and um, skewed scheduling. So that if there is, you know, the combination of masking, uh, six feet, so, you know, the social distancing, the um, uh, uh, um, uh, skewed schedules, uh, you know, plastic guards, no sports, all of those things combined, there's no silver bullet will bring the risk down to a suitable level. And this is, you know, I know it's, I mean, we seem dysfunctional now. The one good piece of news is, like other countries have figured it out. They're not that much smarter than us. Like we can figure this out. And to clarify, when you're talking about markers in the community of like a 5% or a 1%, are you referring to like the larger town community or the state? Or are you referring to the school community itself? I would do the school community. So I would do it county by county. So I could see, I could see, like for Massachusetts, for example, if I look at the numbers, I could see areas in the West, which don't have the kind of density, choosing a different path forward than Boston, which is going to have uh, challenges to de-densifying and has higher, um, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, higher infection rates um, or, or a place like, um, you know, some of our uh, more working class communities like Quincy that, really, that were really hit hard. Let's see, another, speaking of cases rising in a particular area, um, this is another question from Ruthie Yarm, and I hope I'm getting these names right, um, from Santa Cruz, California, is a parent. And Ruthie says, because of the anemic response to COVID-19, cases are rising in my state. It's not just putting me and my family at risk to send our 15-year-old to school, it's risking the trajectory of overall recovery. In order to mitigate this risk, we need a robust response in terms of testing, contact tracing, yeah. protocols, taking into consideration the short time frame before schools restart. I mean, it's August 1st almost yeah. right now, and a lot of schools are looking at opening later this month. Um, and also considering the polarized political Nature. climate in which we live, um, how could a robust response be possible? Uh, so this is, this is where, um, you know, being in, being in crisis management uh, may be helpful for this, this time period in my life. Um, you sort of, uh, we are dealt the hand we have right now and we don't have the leadership that is necessary uh, to have a unified response where you would see a national flattening of the curve, a national masking policy, 
all bars closed, you know, no gyms, but you can do retail, like, like something that was rational. Instead, you have Georgia versus, you know, Massachusetts. And uh, it's what I had written as the articles. This will be for history teachers. This is the Articles of Confederation response. This is like literally, if you wondered if the Articles of Confeder Confederation would work, here's, here's your example. No, you don't pit states against each other. You have no unified response. Okay, I got animated there. Um, but honestly, um, so, so the question is, is that given where we have, how can we piece together an, an agenda that works? That's the world I'm in. It sucks. Can I say that? It's bad. And um, how do I make it slightly better each day? So that's where, um, you know, you're, you're, you have one city, one county, one school district, one state at a time, you know, having policies that, and this will be surprising to people, but this is what I document. 80% of the U.S. population, sorry, close to 80% of the U.S. population is now under masking orders. So this debate that you see on cable TV and the crazy ladies in Target and stuff like that, it's done. Like, it's settled. Like, the, the American public has bought it and they're living in it, right? 48 of the most populous cities, uh, 50 cities in the United States, are under some form of masking orders, right? So, so the American public's getting it and, and local and state politicians are getting it. So you want to push for them to continue to get it, right? Um, because we know we're not going to get what, what you recognize we need, which is the, the national response. Um, and, um, and, uh, and we may get it in, with a new presidency, but right now, um, uh, we just have to constantly be trying to do was essentially a whack-a-mole strategy. But it can, I mean, I don't want to say it can work, but um, you know, you're starting to see, you know, if, if we opened up March, April, we're shutting back down. That's not a bad thing. Uh, you look at the metrics now, many states have pulled back from their reopening plans. Many cities have pulled back. Uh, you, you see uh, Major League Baseball uh, sort of, you know, run into a little bit of trouble this weekend. They are likely, I don't think they're going to finish their season. NFL is hinting they won't start their season. Movie theaters are not open. I mean, so, so we're kind of getting it as well. But I agree with you. It's not ideal. I mean, by any stretch of imagination. And the proof is in the pudding. The, the 140,000 dead, and let's not forget the people who are sick, who are going to have long-term damage, right? me if i were to get it maybe i'd be fine i'm a healthy you know middle-aged woman i'd like to live past 60 or 70. you you know the at the student athletes um uh you know yeah you can fight it maybe you'll even be asymptomatic but what if i look at your heart in 10 years what would it have looked like we don't know we don't know so that's a good point about the long-term consequences yeah. that are just so up in the air yeah no it's it's why you know, there's one thing to tell me I can do something um, and risk and, and, and my own confidence in doing it. So in the consumer world, we call this, you know, the confidence index, right? You can open up a retail store. I'm not going. I, I, got, I can order it. I don't need a new dress. I don't need new shoes. Like, I, it's fine, right? So you've got that. So that's what we're seeing with restaurants and retail. They're open. No one wants to go. I, I went to one restaurant when Massachusetts opened. It was a miserable experience, like it was, right? So you get that, you're, you're, you're seeing in things like sports, players voluntarily saying, I don't wanna risk it, I'm gonna not play. And I think, as you're seeing with some of this litigation in Florida, you're gonna start to see with parents walking with their feet saying, you gotta give me a, a digital option if that's available, um, is, um, is, is parents, you know, playing the confidence index, and, and teachers, I should say, you know, doing the confidence index as well. You're seeing it in litigation right now. Mm -hmm. Um, another question from a teacher in Laytonsville, Maryland, Laura Dyerman asks, if school systems open before a vaccine or effective therapeutics are readily available, veteran teachers eligible for retirement, which is about 20% of teachers, may yeah. retire or quit. So how will school systems, state governments, and the federal government deal with the reduction of teachers in classrooms? And how will they pay for the sudden increase in funds needed for the new retirees? Uh, so to say that our education department, this was the point of the, of the Atlantic article, it's like, we don't, we don't even know what our gaps are. I mean, in other words, it was such an afterthought about the possibility that this pandemic would be here for a while or that it would be raging right so the you know everyone closes schools 
and there was no federal guidance on sort of how to open them, right? So um, uh, once again, we did not treat it like water and electricity as we should. And so in a normal crisis, right, where you have a functioning central government, you would have done what's called a gaps analysis. You would say, sort of, what do we need, right? What's happening? What do we need? What do we have? How do we fill that gap? It's, my, it can be mind boggling. Some of it can be really, really overwhelming, but at least we know, right? Right now, a school district may open and lose 10% of its teacher population overnight, if that's the decision. And so part of what the engagement factor is, is the, the schools or the superintendents need to take, need to communicate both how they're gonna do this and need to listen about what, and I don't mean to call teachers the market at all, but like, what, what are your stakeholders telling you? They're telling you it's a bad decision or they're telling you we can do this if it's you know, hybrid and stuff. Um, it's not that every, te you know, and it's, it's not necessarily the unions, right? It might just be individual teachers who have a different risk assessment. Um, if I'm a healthy teacher and my school district opens in some fashion, I would, and depending on where you are, but let's do Massachusetts because we're sort of in a good place. I would feel very comfortable doing it, um, especially if there's a mandatory masking policy, which Massachusetts does, um, and especially if it's hybrid that we're doing, um, you know, some online, some de-densification. And from the teacher's perspective, I mean, one of the things that I think we've not given enough support on with students, we have it in terms of the di digital divide, is that teaching online is different. I know this, right? My class in the spring went to online. Um, you can't just stand there and do what you were going to do, right? So, so that's one of the things that I wish we were supporting teachers to get better engagement because you, you know, you can't do it by sheer force of personality or maybe some teachers can, I can't. Here's a question that we heard a lot of teachers asking on the Zoom meeting that we had was, yeah. um, this is from Katrina Campbell, who's a teacher in San Diego. Um, she says, can school districts be held accountable for knowingly putting teachers yeah. and students in harm's way? Um, can they make us sign waivers, giving up rights to sue if their safety precautions are negligent? Um, that's something that we heard from a lot yeah. of teachers. So, just, okay, so uh, the, wondering so the, about waivers and yeah. wondering about school accountability. Right. So um, I think the waivers in the public school system, especially if it's, it, it is unionized, I think the waivers would be difficult to enforce. It's not a condition of employment. So I'm a lawyer by training. So, so, but the private, so, and also you have some protections of being a, a, a public employee. The private schools are different. And those are going to be potentially contracts that can be reformed. Um, but there's still gross negligence. So if a school district says you're only going to have 10 people in the class, but, but twice a day, and then the rest is online, um, or, you know, basically how they're structuring is I have 10 in the class, 10 outside the class, they're all together. And then I switch them out the next day. Um, um, and, but, you, but you all of a sudden bring in 32 students, that's gross negligence. So you would have a claim anyway. But this is an area of law that, in, that, that you know, in, in workforce law as well as in labor law, we just don't have a developed doctrine yet. Um, because, and I, you know, once again, I don't, I'm not experimenting with our kids. I got some myself. I just think it's unrealistic to think, you know, we, we don't do anything during, the, during, you know, when the virus is still around and we do everything. I think one of the questions suggested this, we do everything after um, a, um, a vaccine. We can't live like that. And remember the Spanish flu never had a vaccine. Right, so, so sometimes viruses die out, right? So, but we can manage around this. So that's, that, that and so the, the, the legal liability for good or bad management is a, is a doctrine that's still being worked out. I think because it's not at all clear, this is the teacher's lawsuits in Florida and stuff like that, because it's not at all clear whether there's liability, uh, school districts will be cautious. I, I think the fact that a majority I think still, this was definitely, when I wrote the article just a month ago, it was 90%, right? It was like 90% of school districts had announced. I don't think it's more than 50% now. Um, I think the fact that they haven't announced, if your school district has not announced, it is likely to go to online. I think, I think, because I think people are risk adverse because we don't know what the liability is. And speaking of the decision to go online or in person, yeah. um, 
Another question about that is from a parent in Lilburn, Georgia, Michael Rennick, who yeah. says, how nimble do you think schools reasonably must be if they switch between remote learning and in-class learning during the year? It looks like schools may go one way and then have to go back and forth depending on what's happening in the community. So are there adequate plans in place for this kind of adaptability anywhere in the country, do you think? I love this question because I talk about basically adaptive recovery, that, that once we get through this period, we may have a period until further notice, many years, a year, whatever, that I call re adaptive recovery. It's when we learn to adapt, manage, you know, adapt to the virus, manage around it, dance with it, whatever, flatten it, isolate it, whatever it is, we're going to learn better. Masking gets us far, de-densification gets us far, but yeah, definitely we're going to we're going to do that. So it's I can't have a universal answer in terms of what school districts are doing. Here's what parents should be looking for. I think is is how are they um, um, how is the school district dealing with the real digital divide? I mean, all the what I often say in a crisis is you know crisis finds a nation as it is, not as we want it to be. Right. In other words everything that's bad, right? The, the racial disparities, the healthcare disparities, the, the income inequalities get worse, right? So there are ways in which we can, so we have to focus on populations that are more than, are more than likely to fall behind and also don't have the access to keep up, right? So, mm -hmm. so that is why, you know, if a school district opens K to three, I've seen enough data and educators can agree, hopefully, but we've seen enough data from the education community. K through three really matters to be together, um, uh, even though they're impossible to keep apart, right? Where, I mean, I have high school boys. It's not ideal, but I can, I can, they, they can manage their own schedules. They know how to read and stuff. And I, I just have to be on their case and stuff. So you want to, you want to make sure that that gap. And then the second thing is and what, what we, what I advise school districts is, you don't just need a plan to open up. You need a plan when you start to see cases. This is the, which is, look, we're gonna close down for two weeks, back to digital, right? Back to, and parents have to be prepared for that. So that's gonna impact work. Um, it is why I think employers, if, if you're a parent and an employer, think about working. I mean, you should be opening up your office now. Your parents, your parent employees, it's impossible for them to go if you, if you have that option. So there's a lot of factors at play right now um, that, that really do impact um, uh, the decision. There's no universal one, but this is where school districts need to get really, really nimble and adapt. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like that adaptability doesn't need to just happen in the school itself, but in the surrounding community. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, look at these graduations. What I loved is like in Massachusetts, you know, these poor seniors never really got to say goodbye to each other, have a prom, have the big party, do what you know, high school seniors do those last few months, which I remember from my daughter. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, um, you know, some communities, like for graduation, they, they closed all the streets in the, main, in the main area, the downtown, and everyone came out and kids were hanging out of cars. I mean, look, we, we, gotta, we gotta figure this out for them. And I, I should say, you know, so grateful to the teachers too, who, you know, for the most part, um, want this to work. I mean, not, you know, I mean, not, they want this to work and grateful for their flexibility. I mean, the fact that um, so many uh, uh, teachers um, and their unions are willing to change calendars or change uh, how they're teaching, that's, you know, that, that's the kind of adaptability we need. So a couple of more practical questions yeah. in terms of how to arrange what school will look like. Um, Aman Hiragauder from Waltham, Massachusetts is a student um, who wants to know what is your take on older school buildings with poor ventilation or little to no central HVAC? Um, yeah. So they know this will be case by case, but do you think older buildings can safely hold hundreds of students this fall, especially if masks have to be worn in hot buildings? Thing. I think older buildings is hard and that's getting to the urban air area. I'm going to commend a document from my colleague at the School of Public Health, Joe Allen, who has a um, who has a document on schools for health that really looks at risk reduction strategies from the tactical level in terms of ventilation, in terms of access to outside. It's going to depend on school district, um, but it really does come, you know, to 
uh, a couple of criteria that I really honestly just, you know, take from him. He teaches me, I teach him, but you know, you're looking at healthy classrooms in terms of masks and washing of hands and social distancing. You're looking at the healthy buildings, which is filtered indoor air, uh, plexiglass where you can increase outdoor air ventilation. So all these criteria that go into healthy buildings. And then of course, um, you know, healthy policies, right? What are you doing in terms of what the, uh, what the teachers um, should be doing to, to promote healthy policies? Uh, what, what's gonna happen when there's a case? Uh, how do you reinforce a culture of health and safety? Um, healthy schedules, right? You know, the de-densify and the tiered schedules, that's gonna go far. And then obviously healthy activities, transportation, sports. And so a similar question along those lines is from Amanda mueller McArthur, who's a parent in Hickston, Tennessee, um, who wants to know what the plans are for making school transportation safe, given that buses are usually packed and many children are on them over an hour a day. Right. So it's so it depends on what your community is. So there's going to be. Uh, so here's how we're thinking about transportation. Um, the reason why schedules are changing is not just the classroom; it's the transportation. So you're just going to have twice as many rides going on because you're going to bring some portion. I'm sorry, either twice as many rides or half the students um, in the buses and it, getting more buses is almost impossible. So you're just gonna have fewer students. So it is more likely than not, most school districts are going to hybrid for that reason. Um, there's gonna be a ways to think about alternative transportation opportunities, whether it's bikes, uh, uh, rental programs for bikes and, and helmets, um, uh, uh, support from the public transportation system, all masking all the time once again, um, and um, and then and see if you can bring students back and forth for that reason. Some buses are being retro, uh, retrofitted for plexiglass, uh, so the combination of the masking with with the plexiglass is, it, you know, might get us very far. And so there, there is thoughts about this. One thing I want to just say as we end, because I as we end, or I guess there's another question, but one thing that's like worth noting is. We, we all, I mean, this is where parents and teachers can be helpful. And I have to check myself too, but it probably helps that I'm in my job for my kids is we have to stop waiting. I mean, in other words, it's the worst thing we can do is, um, is say everything stops, everything's horrible, like whatever. So I've come to use the term, it drives my kids crazy, but um, uh, is just reimagine. 2020 and 2021 and reimagine it as what I call the now normal not the new normal so we all everyone talks about the new normal like whatever there is no normal this should not feel normal <laughs> and I'm telling you know being in a bus with plexiglass should not feel normal uh, but it's now and we have to help our kids understand this is the now right in other words if we pine as parents for a world that is not, our kids will not experience, right? At least not for the time being. That's not great parenting, I'm being honest with you, right? It's a, you have to say, oh, until normal. We need to help our kids also adapt to a new way of learning, whether it's online, whether it's de-densified, whether it's without sports or without prompts, it's not great, right? But it's now. And I just, that's, you know, my, my, maybe my last words are part of it. I'm a parent. I get it. It sucks. I look at my kids sometimes like God, God knows what this generation of kids is going to be like, you know, when they're, they're either, my, my thought is they're either going to be the most resilient generation or the most, the generation like most in therapy, like one or the other, I don't know yet, but um, there are people really, really suffering right now and whose access to education is probably more important. Uh, for them than say for me, who can provide all sorts of other opportunities. My kids are in public school. Um, and so, you know, if a school district decides access is more important for them, yeah, that's the now, that's the now normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very wise advice, reimagining what we're thinking for 2020. Yeah. There's no going back. There's no going back. There's only going through. And what we're trying to do is do it safely for the kids and for teachers and for families. One final question. Um, is going to be from Maria Solomon, who is a parent in Newport Beach, California. Ah, um, beautiful place. Yeah. Uh, Maria says there seems to be a looming inequality gap yeah. where schools are announcing all online learning. For example, Santa Ana Unified in Orange County, California, just announced all, all, all online for the fall. 
while a large private Catholic school in the same area has had social distance hybrid plans in place for months. Um, so do you think that online learning will worsen inequality and what could be done about it? So I do, I mean, I do, you know, as I said, we're, we're, nothing gets better during a crisis, at least not immediately. We might have learned some lessons. So it will get exacerbated. So a couple things to think, and, and so there are ways to deal with the digital divide. And this is where a whole of government whole, you're gonna hear a dog bark, this is how real life is, because I think the boys are coming back, um, is, um, is uh, uh, how can we have a whole of community support for our students? So this is where not only do you look to the public sector, but you really look to the private sector in terms of access to data, access to equipment, um, access to place, right? If you're like, look, if you're a big employer in a community, you've got a lot of space right now. Can you allow six students in 30 feet apart in the cubicles that are empty right now. So they can just have quiet time. So this is what we're trying, you know, so this is where school districts and parents who may know those places or who are employed uh, might say, look, you know, let's go to our employer and see if we can do this. So there's really creative ways where we, where that population, and even if it's 80% of a school, of a school district, that population needs to be, uh, uh, needs more focus. And we, and, 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 we should probably spend less time on can we open and more time on if we don't open, how do we uh, close that gap? So I really do look to sort of non-governmental entities um, uh, uh, moving forward and thinking about creative ways in which you know parent teachers, um, associations, uh, the teachers union can turn to their partners in the private sector and say, look, for, for three hours a day, can we get these six kids in, use your data, give them quiet, this is the quiet. It's not just the data, it's the quiet, right? Um, you know, that, 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 that most, a lot of communities don't have space for. Well, that was our last question. Thank you so much for- and Thank you guys, this is such a pleasure. And thanks to honestly all the teachers and the students. It was so exciting to see uh, so much engagement. Um, just remember the now normal. None of us should feel normal. Don't want it to feel normal, but it's 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 gonna have to feel more familiar. Um and uh and um yeah and and uh as I said, not going back, we're gonna go through and we'll try to do so as safely as possible. Uh -huh. Well, thank you so much for your words of wisdom. Um and if anybody wants to check out more of your stuff. Uh, Juliet Kime is also the author of Security Mom, and you can check out her recent article in The Atlantic on school reopenings. So thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, you guys. See you later. See you. Take care.